Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. For me, it was back in eighth grade when I first encountered Edith Hamilton's Greek mythology. And presumably most of you at some point in your education, if you're of a certain age, had to study the Greek myths. And one of the myths that I want us to think about as we begin this morning is the story of Narcissus. Now, if you remember from your Greek mythology, Narcissus was the son of two different gods. And Narcissus grew into one of the most beautiful creatures that had ever been on the earth. And many, many people admired his beauty, but no one admired his beauty more than Narcissus himself. Narcissus became famous for his vanity and for his lack of interest in anyone besides himself. And finally, the gods took notice of how utterly selfish and self-centered he was, and they led him through the woods to a reflecting pool where he gazed down into the pool and saw his own reflection and became so enamored of himself that he could not tear his eyes away and he ultimately stayed there and starved to death. It is a sad story, but unfortunately, I think it is a wonderful parable of exactly where our culture finds itself today. We live in an era that is profoundly narcissistic, a word that comes from that mythology. And in our culture, we find the highest levels of narcissism and self-centeredness that have ever been recorded since people began tracking such things. People are obsessed with their own fulfillment, their own individual search for happiness, and their own self-actualization. Yet the thing that is so ironic about this is that in a time where we are paying more and more and more attention to trying to make ourselves happy of being the center of our own universe, people are lonelier and more depressed than any time in human history. There were two surveys that were done, big surveys during this past year, one by a health insurer and one by the Barna Research Group. And it was interesting because it found that the majority of Americans reported feeling lonely, isolated, left out, and not known. Particularly in the age group of 18 to 35, over 70% said that they felt that no one cared deeply about them and no one really believed in them. That is a very sad commentary on where we are as a culture. And then we have the other phenomenon that is happening alongside this, which is the idea that self-actualization and fulfillment personally is more important than any vow or any other commitment you might make. You might have seen in the headlines the sad news about Bill and Melinda Gates' divorce. And in some of the writing about that and the commentary in mainstream media, there's actually been a lot of congratulations about that. And one place uh, said this, couples are not simply drifting apart over time anymore. One or both people in the marriage are making an overt choice to change course so that they can be fulfilled in the time they have left. Recognizing that life is short and precious, one or both partners choose what they feel is the most fulfilling path that leads to their individual self-actualization. Hmm. Whatever happened till death do us part? And then probably the most pervasive thing and the thing that we are least aware of is that our culture has been in a major shift, particularly over the past 20 years, of conflating and confusing the idea of love and what it has always meant in human history, and through this reductionist view, equating love with sex, that all love really is at base sexual desire. And the whole idea is that infatuation is really what it is all about, and that there's no such thing as disinterested love. And because of that, this has become a major factor in identity, 
and people began expressing their identity in terms of their preferences sexually. And this has so many far-reaching and unfortunate uh, consequences for our culture. The unfortunate thing, though, is that we as the church have failed to really lean into these problems and address them. And I think what we see in the gospel reading we had today and the reading from 1 John is a profound call to come back to what is supposed to be the battle cry of God's people, to love, to love as Jesus did. The interesting thing is that our culture is no closer today than it was in the 1940s to answering that question Cole Porter posed in the famous song, What is this thing called love? But what I'd like to do this morning is to look a little bit at this gospel passage, to look at what is the Christian understanding of love, and then to look at why does it matter so much today. So first, most of us, when we look at the Christian understanding of love, if I were to go around and ask you individually, what do you believe love is, most of you would raise your hand and say, well, I know. But the problem is that most of us would have a wrong definition. What we've done, even in the church, is to sometimes reduce love to the idea of being nice, or being polite, or not being mean. Now let me hasten to say, that's good. You want to be nice, you don't want to be mean. But biblical love is much more than that. It is vitally important that we, as the church, reclaim a robust understanding of this truth, because our culture is held captive to this idea of self-actualization and self-love. And the result of that is diseases of despair and loneliness and addiction that are literally killing people. And we, as the church, because we know Jesus Christ, we have the only answer, the only remedy that can solve the hate and division and despair that we find in our culture. And one of the interesting places that you see every now and then a little shout out that comes that the culture some, somehow knows that something is wrong, I noticed in one of the most unlikely places, which was Super Bowl 2020. And if you remember back to Super Bowl 2020, it was particularly well known for a really inappropriate halftime show uh, with Jennifer Lopez. And it had the usual advertisements for fast cars and beer and liquor and all of that. And while I was at a party with some friends trying to pretend I was interested in the game, um, I got up to eat some more seven-layer dip during one of the commercials. And while I was in the kitchen, suddenly I heard these words, storge, eros, philia, agape. And I was like, what? Did someone change it to the Bible channel? Because those are the four words in Greek that come from C.S. Lewis's famous book, The Four Loves, describing the four Greek words for love that are used in the New Testament. And I thought, what are those doing in the middle of the Super Bowl? But someone had caught on to the fact that we are desperate for a definition of love that actually means something. Now, ironically, this was an ad for a life insurer. Uh, <laughs> But I was still nonetheless glad that this truth had been spoken to all of these millions and millions of people listening. And the interesting thing about this is these four loves are so important for us to understand. The first one, storge, is a great thing to think about today for Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all who are mothers. Happy Mother's Day to those mothers who have gone on to their reward in heaven but the love of a mother is a great example of storge, that familial love that's committed no matter what because of the fact that you are related to one another, that looks out for you, and that is based in that relationship that you have. The second word, eros, is the one that seems to be most predominant in our culture. It is the one that is about desire and romance and sexual love, and the symbol of eros is Cupid with the arrow. But the last two are perhaps the most important and the least understood. Philia, or philio, and agape. Philia is the one that means friendship. And it doesn't mean friendship in the way we often think of friends, but it means a deep, bonded friendship that is uh, really committed and significant. And then agape, of course, is the 
love that God models for us. And we see both of these words in today's passage. So I'd like for you to turn to the passage from the Gospel of John, uh, if you will, in your bulletin and follow along with me. And as we look at that passage, what I want you to notice is there are certain words that are repeated over and over again. And as we look at that, I want us to think about the context of this passage. This passage comes from Jesus' Last Supper discourse. This is the last time that Jesus will spend with his disciples. It is the culmination of his earthly ministry. And he is sharing deeply from his heart about what is most important, what he really wants them to remember as they move forward uh, in their ministry. And he is there at the Last Supper, um, this ritual meal. And also think about who is there. It is this group of men. Jesus' disciples, kind of a ragtag group of different backgrounds, um, different ages. Most commentators think some of them were probably still teenagers. Some were in their 30s different professions, all of those things, but it's a group of men sitting around talking about love. Now that ought to get our attention because in our culture today, if you did that, most people would immediately try to change the subject. But what Jesus is saying here is this is what is on his heart and it is most important. And look at the words that are repeated. Love, love, love is repeated over and over again. Commandment is repeated over and over again. Joy is repeated. Friends and friends and friends repeated. And then command, <clears throat> command and love again there at the end. And if you look back at the first John passage that we read, you'll notice these same words are there also. And all of these words are intimately connected with one another. And perhaps one of the most important things that we can see here is the progression of thought that Jesus gives us. He tells us, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And this is truly remarkable because the way that Jesus is loved by the Father is that fascinating and mysterious and eternal love that is welling up in the Trinity that great fountain of love and of life that is eternal, that fully self-disclosing, fully known, fully other-centered love that is full of joy and fulfillment. And the Father has loved Jesus in that way. And there are whole treatises about this love within the Trinity. But then look what Jesus says. He says, love one another as I have loved you. He says that he has loved those disciples in the way that God has loved him. That utterly other-focused, intentional love that is full of joy and commitment, and that they are to model that love to one another, the same love that the Father has for Jesus, the same love that Jesus had for the disciples is to be modeled among them, and that means among us as well. So I want us to unpack a little bit, what does that kind of love look like? Because let me hasten to say, it's not just being nice. It's much, much more than that. And it is the battle cry that we must recover because it should be the thing that is the mark of the church, the mark of the Christian that sets us apart from everyone else and every other belief system in our culture. So the first thing I want us to notice is that this kind of love is an act of will. It's a commandment. I could stand up here all day and say, I command you to feel angry. I command you to feel happy. But it doesn't work. You can't command a feeling. You can only command an action like stand up or sit down. It is an act of will, this type of love. The second thing is that you will see that it's all caught up in this commandment and the Father's commandments, which means God's word. And this is exactly what Andrew was talking about last week in the sermon, that this love is perfected and shown as we live according to God's will, the way that he has made us, the owner's manual, if you will, for what it means to be made in the image of God. 
And also, and perhaps most importantly, it is a love that is all caught up with another big theological word, incarnation. Jesus was in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit, complete and perfect in love. And he chose to leave the comfort of heaven, to set aside his rank and privilege, and to be born in a manger in Bethlehem to be with us. He took the initiative to leave the comfort in which he found himself to be uncomfortable for our sake, that he might bring us into relationship with God. And you notice that when Jesus begins his public ministry and calls those disciples, he is always with them. They are together in a profound way. It is not an isolated hour or two a week. He is absolutely committed to them. He also is utterly other-focused. Something I would commend to you in your free time sometime is to read through the Gospels and look for any time that Jesus asks for something for himself or for his own needs. And what you will find is that does not happen. He is all about loving those who are committed to him and those he encounters along the way. And one of the most remarkable things about it is that it is a strong love that is deeply committed to the other people, and that means not always telling them what they want to hear. We have a misunderstanding sometimes of Christian love when we hear about unconditional love uh, that gets in the way of understanding what God really is about here. Sometimes Jesus' love was tough love. Remember the numerous times he called out the disciples about different things, even saying to Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's pretty strong for someone who loves you. And we don't see anything about Peter was triggered by that and had to go to a safe space. What we see is that they leaned more deeply into their relationship as a result of that. And we see among the disciples and Jesus this deep friendship that is caused by the fact that they are utterly committed not only to one another, but to the mission that God has given them. That is the focus of their friendship. And that friendship is self-sacrificial, modeled especially by Jesus, who says here, greater love than has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And he doesn't just say it, he then the very next day does exactly that. It is a remarkable example. So in this passage, as I've said, there are two words, filio and agape, that are used for love. And this brings us to the last section. Why does this matter so much? It's not just an entertaining study in philology and semantics of Greek words. I think this is one of the most profound truths that can change our lives and will enable us to be change agents in this world that is so broken but so beloved by our Lord. So as we look at why does this matter, we need to remember that when we look in this culture, we see brokenness and despair and people seeking to be self-actualized and happy, but as a result of that, nothing but hate and misunderstanding and division spreading everywhere. Jesus is the only one that can save this world that is dying before our eyes. And filio and agape are two of the doors that we have through which we can invite people, as Jesus did, to come and see, to see the beauty of the kingdom of God, to see the beauty of the love that God has for us and calls us to have for one another. So first, filio. I think and we, when we look in our culture at what we think of as friendship, we so often think of what C.S. Lewis actually called clubability. Clubability means that you, you go to a club and you hang out and you have nice conversation about the weather or the sports or your bridge game or whatever it might be, but there's no depth to the conversation. It's polite and it's pleasant, but there's no real sharing and there's no real truth, beauty, or goodness involved. Lewis says that real friendship arrives out of clubability when two or more companions discover they have something in common which the others do not share, and which until that moment each believed to be his own unique treasure or burden. The typical expression of friendship 
opening up would be something like, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. It is when two such persons discover one another that friendship is born, and instantly they stand together in an, an immense solitude when they are brought together because they see the same truth. These friendships are most profound when they center on the mutual pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness, and the source of those things, which is God himself, Jesus Christ himself. That kind of friendship is the kind of friendship that can change the world. That kind of friendship requires, though, that we learn what it means to be vulnerable, to share our needs, to share our dreams with one another, and to be willing to live out and model that kind of self-sacrificial commitment that is so rare. If you want to see a beautiful fictional example of this, go read The Lord of the Rings and look at the friendship between Frodo and Sam. It is a beautiful example of exactly what Lewis talks about, and I believe what this word philia means in its fullness. Lewis puts it this way about vulnerability. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love at all is to be vulnerable. This deep Christian filio is so desperately needed in our culture, in the church, and in the world. One of my favorite podcasts is one that's called Breakpoint that's done by the Colson Center. And the host, John Stone Street, very often says, if we can't get it right in the church, how can we expect the culture to get it right? And I think he nails that because I think all too often we look around and we think the culture is so broken and we rail against those people out there who are so bad. But the fact of the matter, my friends, is that if we don't love each other in the church, if we don't model that, how can we expect the culture to get on board? This leads me to the last word for love, agape. And this is the word that is used over 260 times in the New Testament and was taken by the New Testament writers as the uniquely Christian expression of love. But unfortunately, we have misunderstood this. I think if I asked 10 people out in the congregation, what do you think agape is, most people would say unconditional love. And there's some truth to that, but we misunderstand that because when we hear unconditional love, we think that means we'll do whatever you want and I will still love you. Whatever you do, even if it's really bad for you or harmful to you and harmful to other people, I will still love you and just support you and affirm you in everything. That is not what agape means. I think the best definition I've found is this one. Agape is a pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's highest good. A pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's highest good. We are called to love God and to love others with this kind of love, and it is the kind of love that we see God setting the standard for by sending Jesus and then Jesus laying down his life for us on the cross. It is interesting because we are very afraid, I think, of the full implications of what this kind of love means. Because it means it's not business as usual. It means we have to break out of our comfort zone. Look, listen to what the great English 19th century bishop J.C. Ryle said about this commandment. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The frequent repetition of this command teaches the vast importance of Christian love and the great rarity of it. How anyone can pretend to Christian hope who is ignorant of Christian love, it is hard to understand. 
He that supposes that he is right in the sight of God because his doctrinal views are correct, while he's unloving in his temper and sharp, cross, snappish and ill-natured in the use of his tongue, exhibits wretched ignorance of the first principles of Christ's gospel. The crossness, spitefulness, jealousy, maliciousness, and general disagreeableness of many Christians and high professors of sound doctrine are a positive scandal to Christianity. Where there is little love, there can be little grace. Ken Boa puts it this way, that the fall has invited extreme selfishness to linger heavy in our culture. Ours is the gospel charge to go to the nth degree to love those who are broken, who are held captive by our culture's views of self, a love that is not merely theoretical, but is expressed in action. Just think, God did not choose to stay in heaven. His love caused him to give and to send his one and only son, sent to earth as the most tangible expression of love ever known. So I think there are four ways that we can think about this in terms of actions that we can take that will enable us to embrace this battle cry of love that we see in this passage. And the first one of these is to choose to love, to remember that it is an action, it is a choice of the will. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it is a very important turn from the pride and narcissism that's in our culture and also affects all of us in the church. We must choose to love others, to pray for love divine that we just sang about in both of those wonderful hymns today, to look for God's love to come into our lives and overflow out to other people. The second thing is that we have to reject feelings as the only basis for reality and loving relationships. Our culture is obsessed with feelings, and we don't feel like doing it, we don't do it. And the problem with that is that there are many things that we know that are right and good and commandments of God, and God's commandments don't say, do this commandment on the days that you feel like it. We are instructed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that doesn't mean to feel all gooey and sentimental. It means to go out and do that and practice it, to pray for people, to seek what we may be able to do to be loving in their lives. And thirdly, one of the things we need to do is to embrace a full and biblical understanding of the golden rule, where Jesus sums up about this love. So if I were to ask you all, what is the golden rule, what would you say? Let's give it a try. Okay, that was very good. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So we know that. That's good. We know what the scripture says. But I'm sorry to say that I think most of us, at least if I am any example, we fail in being able to write the paragraph to explain what that actually means. I would suggest to you that for many of us, we have translated that verse, that command, it is a command, to mean this, do not do to others what you don't want them to do to you. So, if you don't want to be cussed out when you are at a store, don't cuss out the clerk that's at the store. If you don't want to be cut off in traffic, don't cut off other people in traffic. And let me hasten to add, those are good things. You don't want to do those things. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. I think we have been uh, affected by over-familiarity with this. And I would suggest to you, anytime you feel like you've gotten over-familiar with the scripture passage and it's not resonating for you, I would suggest that you might go and read in Eugene Peterson's wonderful paraphrase that's called The Message. Look how he renders the golden rule from Matthew 7, 12. Here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself, what you want people to do for you, then take the initiative and go and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. And I think this captures two essential points. The first is to consider what makes you 
happy? What makes you have a wonderful day? What makes you feel loved and fulfilled and purposeful and all of that? Think about all of those kinds of things, actions that others may do that help you with that, and then turn around and actually take the initiative and go and do that to other people. Don't wait to be asked. Don't wait until there's a crisis. Take the time to be focused on them, to serve them, to seek their best. And the funny thing about that is that as you do that, that other word we haven't talked about yet will appear, the word joy. God has hardwired the human heart so that we find joy when we set aside our own agenda and seek to serve others. Imagine what would happen if all of the Christians in the world started practicing that understanding of the golden rule, taking the initiative to be loving and thinking about each person that they meet during the day, what could they do that would be loving for that person? And then the fourth thing is to focus daily on Jesus' words about the mark of the Christian. Jesus says several times that the mark of the Christian is love. By this, all men you will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. And we see this modeled so beautifully in the early church. You look in Acts chapter 2, and it talks about how the disciples, the body of Christians, and those who had been converted to the faith were all together. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. And don't miss that first word, they were together. They had chosen to go and be together. And it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Not because they had a great evangelism campaign going on. The reason was that Christian love is a magnet that is irresistible to people, particularly when you live in a broken and lonely and isolated world. When people out in the world see Christians who are together, who are loving each other, who are bearing each other's burdens, who are finding joy every day, who are not filled with complaining and despair, they want to be part of that. And as a church, the more that we can begin to break out and model that in our relationships, we will not have enough pews to hold people. The world is desperate for this kind of love. And the thing that we must remember is it is the only hope that we have. It is the only hope in this sinful and broken world that God loved enough to send his son to give his life for. So my friends, let us learn what that battle cry of love means. I would like to close with some words that we're going to sing in our closing hymn, and I'd like you to close your eyes and just listen to these words. It is a great mandate for us as God's people. O oh, church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies, an army bold whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure, and Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. O oh Lord Jesus, teach us to love. Amen.